It is good to be with you to study together again tonight. Hope all of you are doing well. Hope to see you on Sunday, either at 9 or at 10.30 a.m. You can join us at one of the two services. And if you can, I hope you'll sign up online using the Sign Up Genius account. If you don't have access to the internet, uh, get in touch with me or really with any other member of the congregation who has an email address in the church directory, and they'd be glad to do that for you. So if you need any help with it, get in touch with me or with Kenna, and we'd love to get you signed up before Sunday. Uh, some of you noticed that we sent out an email yesterday giving some updates on the COVID situation, but for those of you joining us on the phone who may not have access to email, uh, I'll just quickly hit a few of the highlights. Basically, in keeping with the latest CDC guidance, masks are recommended for those who have not yet been vaccinated. And for the rest of us, whenever we see somebody wearing a mask, let's just take that as a sign to give that person maybe some extra space. And I'm sure they'll have a reason for wearing a mask, and so uh, obviously we won't make fun of them, nothing like that. But uh, we'll have to be understanding of each other as we have been, and we'll continue that going forward. Um, we will continue our current schedule as we've done for the last several months. We'll continue that through the month of June. But starting on Sunday, July 4th, we plan on adding a Bible class for all ages between the two services. So to do this, we'll need to move the second service to 11 a.m., and so we'll have the early worship at 9, Bible class at 10, and the late service at 11. Some of you may know that before COVID, we actually had a number of comments from visitors and members alike that our building was getting too crowded. And so especially those who would come in right at 1029, 1030 on a Sunday morning, you come in that back door and it looks like the only pew open is the very front pew. And that is obviously not ideal for visitors. And so we've had a few comments over the last couple of years about that. So hopefully that'll help with the, with the overcrowding going forward. It is a good problem to have, but we'll give this a shot for a little while and uh, we'll, we'll continue this and see how it goes until we find a larger facility or we move forward from there. Tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, explains the growth of the early church. It's written by Luke, a medical doctor, to a man by the name of Theophilus. And it covers a period of time from roughly 30 to 60 AD, so about 30 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first seven chapters. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarize chapter 1 with the word ascension. In Acts 2, we looked at the beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 3, we saw a man carried by his friends and left there at the temple gates. He is healed by Peter and John. And so the summary is carried and cured. In Acts 4, Peter and John are arrested and threatened by the council to stop preaching the gospel. But they are determined disciples. And so they move forward and they continue. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. As Peter and the other apostles are arrested, they're then let out of jail by the angel, and they go right back to preaching, and so there was the empty jail. We've summarized chapter 6 with the words, first deacons, but always with a question mark. Uh, seven men were appointed to coordinate the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows, and this then led us into chapter 7, where one of these servants, a man by the name of Stephen, continues preaching. He does an amazing job, just a wonderful sermon. Uh, outlining all of Jewish history and the stubbornness of the Jewish leaders and their rebellion against God on a continual basis. But Stephen becomes, because of that, the first martyr, stoned to death. And so Stephen is the great hero in chapter 7. Last week then, we finished chapter 7. We actually also moved into the first few verses of Acts chapter 8, mainly because of a young man by the name of Saul. At the end of chapter 7, Saul was the young man holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. And then in the first few verses of chapter 8, Saul basically leads a widespread persecution against the church. He chases people down for being Christians and drags them back to Jerusalem. Well, in response, the early Christians run. They scatter. They flee in all directions. But they preach the gospel as they go, obviously fulfilling Jesus' command to go into all the world, preaching from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth, as Jesus summarized and predicted in Acts 1, verse 8. Well, today we pick up with another one of those seven servants from Acts chapter 7, as we pick up with what Philip has been doing. So we've looked at Stephen and what he's been up to. We now move along to Philip, another one of those seven men. And we'll look at Acts chapter 8 in two parts. Part 1 tonight, dealing with Philip in Samaria. 
And then part two next Wednesday, if the Lord wills, where Luke explains Philip's role in baptizing the officer from Ethiopia, the Ethiopian eunuch, as he's often known. And the ABCs of Acts tonight is H, starting for How Can I? And that, of course, is a question that was asked by the Ethiopian officer. But we'll get to that in part two. I just wanted to put that on the screen tonight. How Can I is the H for chapter 8. But if you can think of something better than how can I, especially from the first half of this chapter, go ahead and let me know. I would really appreciate that. And if it's better than how can I, we may have to update it as we did Carried and Cured. But uh, let me know if you have any improvements on that. So let's start tonight with Acts 8 verses 4 through 8. This is an update on Philip, one of the seven. Therefore, those who had been scattered went around, went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, so there was much rejoicing in that city. Well, carried over from last week, we come back to verse 4. I think I kind of previewed that last week, that verse 4 is really the end of one paragraph and the beginning of another. So we're looking at Acts 4 again, but that's where the early Christians are on the run. They are fleeing from Saul. They're scattering all over that area, and as they go, they preach the word of God. Philip, then, is one of many, and as I mentioned, he is also one of the seven. Nevertheless, Philip is also scattering, and he scatters up north to Samaria. And I notice the text here says he went down to Samaria. That would be in terms of elevation. Um, Jerusalem was at a higher elevation than Samaria. So some have latched onto this and said, ah, look, you know, there's a mistake in the Bible, but really there's not. And so Luke is not speaking in terms of north and south. He's speaking practically as they would have in those days, talking about uh, the elevation of that area. So he goes from Jerusalem down to Samaria. Um, so I'm kind of curious, what happened to the other men? You know, we know about Stephen, and here now we know about Philip, but what about the other guys? What about the other people? What about these other people that we sometimes refer to as deacons, the non-deacon deacons or whatever we want to say there? You know, where did they go? And, and really, it's interesting to me that we have no idea. As we've said several times in this study, Acts can be described as some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. Only here we have Philip scattering and preaching the gospel as he goes. And he is one of literally thousands who are doing this in all different directions. As I understand it, Samaria was north of Jerusalem. As I just mentioned, it is pretty much where the northern kingdom of Israel used to be. You may remember from our studies from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, that the northern kingdom was taken away into Assyrian captivity back in 721 BC because of their rebellion against God. And they never really came back together as a nation, as the southern tribes did. But there were a few survivors, and these survivors uh, often intermarried with their pagan neighbors. And that's why the Jewish people often had so much hatred for the Samaritans. They were the half-breeds. It's an awful accusation or insult to make against them, but that's the way many of the uh, Jewish people thought of the Samaritans. They were the compromisers. Instead of following God, they had gone off and started relationships with the locals as God prohibited them from doing. And so Samaria was, though, in God's plan, wasn't it, for the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Samaria and even to the uttermost, uttermost parts of the earth. So this is Samaria. And as he flees to Samaria to get away from Saul and Saul's persecution, Philip begins preaching Christ to them. As a gospel preacher then, Philip, he doesn't discriminate, does he? He's not the traditional Jewish man who says, oh, well, the Samaritans, they are the kind of people that we really shouldn't be preaching to. He doesn't do that, but he follows the example of his Lord. Like Jesus, when Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, Philip preaches without regard for their background. And I guess we should point out Philip, that is, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, is a Greek name. So he's some kind of Greek a convert, perhaps, to Christianity. So everybody needs to hear the gospel. And Philip, he preaches the gospel even up there in Samaria. And when Philip preaches, the people pay attention, don't they? 
He's not a boring preacher. So uh, they're listening very intently. They uh, appreciate the words that he speaks in part because of the message itself, but also because of the signs and the wonders that he was performing. So he's casting out demons. He's also healing those who are paralyzed and the people are rejoicing over this. And this leads us to what happens next. So let's continue then with Acts 8 verses 9 through 13. Acts 8, 9 through 13. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So we're introduced to Simon, who formerly practiced magic. This probably was not a uh, pull a rabbit out of a hat kind of magic, was it? But this was probably uh, something closer to sorcery. And at one time, Simon had been a big deal, right? We see that in this passage. He was very popular. And all the people were claiming that Simon was someone great. He had this huge reputation. And they used to say, this man is what is called the great power of God. And so it almost seems like some kind of a title. This man, Simon, was apparently considered to be God's power on earth to these people. He was a well-respected man for the power that he had. Simon could do some amazing things. However, when Philip shows up, the people seem to turn away from Simon and toward Philip. And so we learn from that that Philip's signs and wonders were apparently able to outperform Simon's magic. And that tells us something about the nature of miracles. In verse 12, when they hear Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, Luke tells us in this account that they were being baptized, both men and women alike. And just remember Luke's emphasis on women. Here he includes the women very specifically. He doesn't just say many were being baptized. He doesn't say this many men were being baptized, but he includes the women in this number. So it's just interesting to me. Uh, we should also note here that preaching about Jesus and his kingdom leads to people being baptized. We see it here. We also will see it with the Ethiopian eunuch in the second half of this chapter next week, if the Lord wills. So Philip has a habit of preaching Jesus, and in response, he ends up baptizing people. So the preaching of Jesus, the preaching of God's kingdom, results in people being baptized. In verse 13, even Simon believes this message. So he is convinced by it, and he's baptized. And this is important because based on what happens later, some have suggested that Simon never really was a Christian in the first place. And he was faking it or something like that. And they take this view because they go into this thinking that once you're a Christian, you can never fall away from the faith. And so their only way of dealing with what's about to happen here is to suggest that Simon must have been faking it here, that Simon never really obeyed the gospel. And yet, as we read through this account for the first time, if we read it a number of times, we really have no indication whatsoever of this in the text itself. So Luke tells us that Simon believes and is baptized, just like everybody else in Samaria back in verse 12, and just as Jesus instructed in the Great Commission, believe and be baptized. And that's exactly what this man does along with the others. There's nothing different from what Simon does and what the other people of Samaria are doing. At the end of verse 13, we find that Simon was especially impressed with the signs and the great miracles that were taking place. Obviously, uh, as a magician, or a former magician, we might say, uh, Simon is truly and constantly amazed. I'm thinking magicians watching each other tr watching each other's tricks it would be hard to impress another magician and yet here when simon sees what philip is doing he is amazed at it this is different and so this should tell us something about the miracles that are happening here they are not faking these signs and wonders this is the real deal uh, but instead when a magician is impressed with signs and wonders i think we have another reminder here that the miracles are absolutely real 
Well, this leads us to what happens next. So let's continue then with Acts 8, verses 14 through 17. Acts 8, 14 through 17. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Remember last week, we learned that the apostles stayed behind in Jerusalem, while many of the other uh, disciples scattered to avoid the persecution. And so when the apostles back in Jerusalem hear that those up in Samaria had received the word of God, that things were going well, uh, they send Peter and John up there, and they go for a reason. There is a purpose for their visit. And the purpose is to give these new Christians the ability to perform miraculous signs themselves. We'll actually see this even more clearly in verse 18. We'll get there in just a few moments. But here, Peter and John head up to Samaria to pray for these people and to give them the Holy Spirit in some sense. So these people had been baptized in the name of Jesus, but they had not yet received the ability to perform miracles. And so that reminds us that the ability to perform miraculous things was not automatically given to people at the point of baptism, but it had to come with the laying on of the apostles' hands. In verse 17, then Peter and John start laying their hands on these people, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the apostles' hands. I think we mentioned this a few weeks ago, but there are a number of reasons in Scripture for the laying on of hands. Um, actual healing, like people would lay their hands on people and they would be healed, uh, setting somebody apart for some special task or a mission. Uh, like the appointment of elders or deacons or missionaries. I think we see it in the opening verses of Acts chapter 13. Uh, today, we might literally lay hands on somebody, a reference to a physical fight. That's one use of that word, laying on hands. Uh, but here, the laying on of hands refers to the transmission of miraculous or special spiritual gifts. So a lot of times we see, oh, somebody had their hands laid on them in Scripture. It, it does not always mean this, but in this case... Um, they are referring to the transmission of the power to do miraculous spiritual gifts. So just to be clear, Philip has the ability to perform miracles, but he could not give or transmit that power to others. So let's continue with the next paragraph, and let's continue then with Acts 8, verses 18 through 24. Acts 8, 18 through 24. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. In verse 18, Simon sees what's happening here. And he sees that the ability to perform miracles is bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And he wants this power. Just a note here, he isn't necessarily interested in the ability to perform miracles, is he? If we look at that carefully. But he's interested in the ability to give this power to others. That's what he wants out of this. Not just miraculous power himself, but he wants to be able to give this to other people. As a former magician, I'm assuming that he sees this perhaps as a money-making opportunity, just as a magician might sell his secrets to other magicians, so also Simon is perhaps interested in selling the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. So he's wanting to spend money to do this. We aren't told necessarily why he does this, but I'm just guessing that he's hoping to spend money to make money. That's one possibility. The other possibility goes back to his ego. Remember, up until he obeyed the gospel, he was known as the great power of God. And so there's a chance that he wants to get some of that uh, recognition back. However, notice Peter's response. May your silver perish with you, because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. I know I've referred to Eugene Peterson's paraphrase from time to time. The message 
And in his words, and I, th I think also in J.B. Phillips' translation, he says something very similar, but they have Peter saying, to hell with you and your money. And I know I've referred to this a time or two before, but that's what they say in those paraphrases, to hell with you and your money, you along with it, something like that. And we look at what Peter says here, and it's it's tempting to criticize. It'd be easy to criticize Peter by suggesting, you know, that's not really the attitude that we need to be having with new converts, Peter. I mean, you're a little, a little harsh on the man here, aren't you? And yet uh, we understand now that it is incredibly serious. Uh, just as the situation with Ananias and Sapphira was also serious. As Peter goes on to say, you have no por part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. So may your silver perish with you, is what Peter literally and most accurately says. Years ago, we had a regular visitor who had, he had left his wife due to financial disagreements. They were getting in arguments over money. And so he's like, I'm out of here. So he left her because of arguments over money. And this man was then dating another woman, that, and he was still married to his first wife. And he knew what we taught as a congregation about divorce and remarriage. And so before he proposed to his girlfriend and divorced his wife, he came to me after one of our Wednesday classes, and he said, if I divorce my wife over financial issues and if I marry my girlfriend, will we be accepted here at the congregation? And that was his question. Will we be accepted here? And I took him to Matthew 19. I explained that no, Jesus allows only one reason for divorce and remarriage. And, and arguing over finances is not that one reason. You need to go back and work things out with your wife. Get back together, work through those issues, get a counselor, do whatever it takes to work through those things. And at this point, the man pretty much said, let me remind you, I am a big giver. I give a lot of money to this church. And in that moment, my mind went back to Simon here in Acts chapter 8. Later, I thought maybe I should have responded with Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, to hell with you and your money. Uh, in the moment, though, I didn't do that. Thankfully, not. But I explained to the man, you cannot buy your way into the kingdom of God. Membership into the Lord's kingdom is not for sale. And obviously, that is not the response that he was looking for. And he left and he went off and he married that other woman without ever having a valid reason for divorcing his first wife. As I remember it, he came back a few months later after that second marriage and he checked in again just to make sure. But our response was, you need to repent. You need to get out of that second marriage. Described by Jesus as committing adultery in, Acts, or in uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9 again, we cannot buy our way into the kingdom of heaven. So notice Peter's demand here. What needs to happen? What is Peter explaining? What needs to happen here? In verse 22, Peter says, Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. I would point out here just to notice Peter does not tell Simon to be rebaptized, does he? He doesn't say, oh man, that was a really bad sin. We need to immerse you again here. Um, that is not what is said. I know sometimes people think that if they've really sinned in a big way, uh, that they need to be baptized again. But that is not what Peter says. Instead, Peter tells Simon to repent. As we've studied time and time again, repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, resulting in a change in the way that we live. Some have described this as God's second law of pardon. We might say that God's first law of pardon is hearing the gospel, believing it, turning away from sin, confessing Jesus as the Christ, and being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. That's the first law of pardon. But once we sin after being saved, we don't go back and do all of that all over again every time that we sin. A lot of us would be being baptized every single day. We'd spend most of our lives under the water, more under than over. Um, but instead, if we've already believed and have been baptized properly, when we sin again, we don't go through all that again, but we repent and we pray. In other words, we keep on turning back, away from sin, back toward God, and we ask God for his forgiveness. And that's what Peter says to Simon. He needs to repent and pray. Because as Peter explains in verse 23, Simon is apparently lost at this point. Having obeyed the gospel and having been saved, he's now, something happened with what he did here, and he's in danger. He's in bondage to sin. 
So yes, he obeyed the gospel earlier in this chapter, but after turning to God, he turned back to his old sinful ways. And that's what Peter's dealing with. In the end, it seems to me that Simon is so moved and so overwhelmed by Peter's words that instead of praying himself, he instead asked Peter to pray on his behalf. And I've been in those situations. You've been in those situations where somebody is just so overwhelmed with what they've done. No, you please pray for me. And obviously, as a congregation, we are just honored uh, to do that. We aren't really given a resolution to this, are we? I, I would like to see a little bit more here in verse 24 to tell us more of what happens next. Um, you know, this is what he's told to do. He says, please pray for me yourselves. And then Luke kind of drops it. So we don't really have a resolution. We're not told what happens. But it, it seems, at least to me, as if Simon responds appropriately. I mean, I wouldn't swear my soul on that, but that's the way I'm leaning here. And I would suggest that we do the best we can to follow Simon's pattern today. If, if one of us drifts away from the faith, if we sin, we don't need to get rebaptized for that reason. But instead, we encourage each other to repent and pray. We pray for ourselves, or we can also pray for each other if that's what the situation calls for. If we're not able to, um, we know from the closing verses of James that the prayers of a righteous person can accomplish much. And so we turn to somebody we know is righteous, and we have them pray on our behalf. Well, this brings us to a good place to pause for tonight. Uh, over the last couple days, I was hoping we could make through the whole chapter, but uh, really um, want to do more justice, we might say, to the second half of this chapter with the Ethiopian officer and his conversion. So I hope you can join us next week, and uh, we'll pause here for tonight. So next week, let's pick up with Acts 8.25, and the rest of Acts 8 is Philip receives a new assignment. So he's preaching in Samaria. Things are going incredibly well, but God calls him away for a special mission. So I would invite you to read the rest of Acts 8 this week. And let's be thinking of any other ways to summarize Acts 8 with a word or a phrase that starts with the letter H. We need some kind of H for chapter 8. How can I is our best option at this moment. If you can beat that, let me know and I'll be glad to consider it. Uh, thank you for spending time together tonight in the study of the word. I hope to see you for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or at 1030. Again, that is our schedule from here through the end of June. Things change July 4th, but for the next few weeks, uh, we're continuing on as it has been. This would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help, and let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. I'd be glad to do that personally, or let it be known to the congregation in the bulletin or by email, uh, if that's better for you. Well, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us a written history of the early church. Tonight, we're especially thankful for your servant, Philip. In a sense, we have now scattered farther than those early Christians could ever possibly imagine. And so we ask for wisdom and courage as we do the best that we can to share the good news of your kingdom with those around us. We pray that we would represent you well. When we sin, we pray that we would always turn back, coming to you for forgiveness, that our hearts would never grow cold, but that we'd always be sensitive to your word. We pray for patience as we encourage those who struggle, that we would do that with the utmost of love and concern. So many around us are having a hard time with life in general, physical, emotional struggles, overwhelming grief, persistent temptations. And so tonight we ask for strength for ourselves, but we also ask for wisdom as we help each other to stay strong. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.